So think back again to the four sub-focuses, spiritual, emotional, psychological and physical. Which sub-focus do you think each of the following artists fit into? Intimate Immensity is an immersive, site-specific installation of collaged works on paper that draw on the language of maps to create imaginary landscapes that depict physical and psychological spaces. Britain's interest in exploring the tension between chaos and imposed order, the concrete and the imaginary, the known and the unknown. According to the artist, initially I began this body of work as a way of connecting to my father, a long haul cross country truck driver who died when I was young. Based on road maps, routes my father often travelled, and an invented conglomeration and fragmentation of those passageways. My works on paper help me piece together the past and make up the parts I cannot know. What kind of journey do you think this is? Physical, spiritual, emotional or psychological? Pause the video here, Marta, and discuss your thoughts. This work can be read on a number of levels. Of course, there's a physical aspect to her work as she references maps and physical journeys. The work itself can also be read as a physical manifestation of her intuitive process, a map of her creative journey. There's also an emotional connection, as Britain is heavily influenced by her personal longing to connect with her deceased father. The psychological aspect can be seen in the navigation and search for the unknown that mapping represents. Collage, drawing, painting, staining, printing and cutting paper are Britain's methods for navigating the blurry terrain of memory and imagination. According to Britain, travelling, navigating routes, mapping our experiences, making choices at crossroads, viewing purpose as a destination, these common metaphors link experiencing life with the notion of a journey. In my work, I often think about how the retelling of our stories, the reconstruction of our journeys, helps make sense of the, of the now and how the retelling is its own journey. Mapping serves as a metaphor for searching, an implication of the unknown in wide open spaces and a trace of how we see where we've been. Painting through staining, seepage and absorption becomes a metaphor for the fluidity of remembering mimicking the geological na layers, sorry, the geologic layers that constitute memories. Her work has also been read on a spiritual level as her installations are constructive of space as they are destructive, structured and contained but also breaking apart, a reference to the cycles of life and death and the journey between which is at the core of Britain's inspiration. Peter Fraser approaches the concept of journey in a different way, embarking on exploratory journeys through various landscapes. Twelve Day Journey depicts Fraser's journey through the southwest of England in 1983 with chance encounters and random walks and bus journeys. What kind of journey do you think this is? Physical, spiritual, emotional or psychological? Watch Fraser as he explains his work and then pause to discuss your ideas. It's almost as if there's a smell in the air and I'm um, being forewarned that a moment is approaching so I need to have the camera ready. In a sense I never set out to do anything other than make myself available to allow that moment where there's an upsurge of energy from the unconscious mind into the conscious mind which is the moment when I know I have to make a photograph. One of the first published groups of pictures I made um, was called 12 Day Journey 
which uh, was work I made in 1983. I just traveled for 12 days. I took 12 days out of my normal life. I ended up in Salisbury eventually, but to be able to concentrate for 12 days and nights um, without interference was such a delirious joy. When I was in America um, spending time with William Eggleston, ironically, I was also thinking about England, and I decided to make a whole series of pictures from Bristol Cathedral, in other words, a very dramatic physical expression of Christianity, and walk all the way to Glastonbury. This is a photograph I made inside a school <clears throat> on a Sunday, totally deserted. Um, and what I loved about this picture was, was the difference between these two blue buckets, which initially appear to be the same. But the closer you go in, the more you realize these two blue buckets are very different. This uh, points the finger at what's so important for me about um, moving around in the world and making discoveries, coming across seen situations that I've never ever seen before and it's in that moment that a certain kind of intensity, a flash of recognition of the importance of what is standing in front of me takes place. It's got everything to do with the fact that I've never seen that scene before. Everything in the universe is made up of small things, so small things are critical to why and how the universe actually exists. I think small things are the key. They're the absolute key to everything. I think what's really uh, kind of amazing about being surrounded by all this work is the degree to which I'm confronted with the aphysical expression of my own unconscious mind and the mysteriousness and scope and range of the unconscious is something that I think we're seeing a very small expression of here and it's very, very exciting. In a very literal way, of course, Fraser is embarking on a physical journey as he moves through and interacts with his physical environments. But watching him speak about his experience during the journey, it becomes clear that this is only one of the surface layers. Fraser speaks about how he experiences an upsurge of energy from the unconscious mind into the conscious mind, which can be read on a psychological or even spiritual level. The delirious joy he describes when referring to his 12-day journey reminds me of an almost nirvana-like meditative state, which can certainly be read as a spiritual journey. He also describes his journeys as not only enabling him to connect to new places, but through them as a way to understand the universe through his insights, which he describes as a moment of intensity, a flash of recognition of the importance of what is in front of him. This deep awareness and connection could certainly be described as spiritual in nature. He also describes his work as being a physical expression of his own unconscious mind, the traces of which could be viewed as a psychological journey. Patrick Keeler also records exploratory journeys around England through a fictional unseen character called Robinson. Robinson's chance encounters with various locations cause him to reflect on the significance of places and what he sees there in relation to greater global themes, such as the economy or politics. For his installation, the Robinson Institute at Tate Britain in 2012, Keeler selected images of landmarks and locations in the English landscape from Tate's collection to illustrate the development of capitalism. So what kind of journey do you think this is? Physical, spiritual, emotional or psychological? Watch Keeler discussing his work and then pause the video and have a chat about what you think. This exhibition is called the Robinson Institute. The exhibition is based on a journey undertaken by a fictional person called Robinson. It's the second manifestation of this journey, the first one being a film which was released in 2010 with the title Robinson in Ruins. The mission statement for the Robinson Institute 
goes something like the Robinson Institute aims to promote political and economic change by developing the transformative potential of images of landscape. But the mission statement for the journey goes something like, from a nearby car park, he surveyed the centre of the island on which he was shipwrecked. The location, he wrote, of a great malady that I shall dispel in the manner of Turner by making picturesque views on journeys to sites of scientific and historic interest. So there is a, a suggestion that images of landscape have a transformative potential, which is not unconnected with political and economic change. What Robinson is trying to dispel in the manner of Turner uh, is neoliberalism. The exhibition is laid out in an anti-clockwise circuit and it's divided into seven stages which are suggested by stages in the journey. And the first stage is, is a, an introduction to, the, to uh, what we call Robinsonism, which is the method. We're standing in section two, it's called 1795, so it centres on the events of 1795. Section three begins with um, the departure from Newbury, a short distance to Greenham Common where the journey begins to encounter all sorts of evidence and traces of the US-UK military relationship. Section 4 is called the non-human and is slightly less place specific than the others, although it is time specific because it's, there are a lot of flowers in this section and so it's, it's kind of early summer. Group 5 is about agriculture, group 6 is, is about the road itself and then 7 is the sort of destination the protagonist, Robinson, turns up at this disused cement quarry and he realises that he must communicate with these so-called researchers to suggest that they should establish um, some sort of experimental centre in this quarry, which is perhaps where the Robinson Institute is based. There are obvious physical and psychological aspects to this work, reminiscent of psychogeography, as Robinson moves through the landscape with a new awareness of history and meaning, paralleled by the audience's physical movement through each section of the exhibition. The journey that takes place takes on a historical and psychological significance, as the audience is encouraged to consider the origins of the current economic crisis. Throughout the Robinson Institute, images of landmarks and locations in the English landscape are employed to illustrate the development of capitalism. Audiences are invited to trace Robinson's steps and consider the connections that he makes. For example, the 1975 amendment to the Settlement Act, which enabled the rural poor to migrate more easily to industrial towns and cities, is shown alongside an unusually large meteorite that fell that same year. Robinson's discovery of the Boyle Hook commemoration plaque on Oxford's High Street, which celebrates two of England's most important scientists, triggers further consideration of the historical events that led to the Industrial Revolution, as his photograph of the memorial site is juxtaposed with Ed Ruschke's Mad Scientist and L.S. Lowry's Industrial Landscape. There is a prevailing climate of decline in Keeler's work. Decline is charted as a geographical as well as historical matter. Recession in some places connect to progress elsewhere, indeed placed as part of the same cultural and economic process. From a nearby car park, he surveyed the centre of the island on which he was shipwrecked. The location, he wrote, of a great malady that I shall dispel in the manner of Turner by making picturesque views on journeys to sites of scientific and historic interest. The great malady Robinson seeks to dispel in the manner of Turner recalls the words of another cultural wanderer, Charles Baudelaire. In his journal, Baudelaire spoke of the great malady, horror of one's home. For Keeler, 
This signifies horror of homemade English pathologies, including racism, militarism, bad food, sexual repression, hatred of intellectuals, indolence, and ultimately neoliberalism, which in general terms refers to a political model that transfers economic control from the public sector to the private sector. Neoliberalism is famously associated with the economic policies introduced by Margaret Thatcher in the United Kingdom and Ronald Reagan in the United States. The financial crisis of 2007 is seen by some academics as one of the ultimate results of the implementation of neoliberal policies in the 1970s. In 2009, while he was editing Robinson in Ruins, Keeler wrote, I have embarked on landscape filmmaking in 1981 early in the Thatcher era, after encountering a surrealist tradition in the UK and elsewhere, so that cinematography involved at the pursuit of a transformation, radical or otherwise, of everyday reality. I had forgotten that landscape photography is often motivated by utopian or ideological imperatives, both as a critique of the world and to demonstrate the possibility of creating a better one. This exhibition suggests, somewhat optimistically, that engagement with actual and artistic landscapes may inspire the revolutionary overthrow of neoliberalism.